<laughs> Hello, everybody. Super excited to have you all here for tonight's virtual class on the Pino family. I have now been doing virtual classes for almost a year. I think in a couple of weeks, it will be a year anniversary of my first virtual class. But this is the first time I've ever done a class about genetic varieties and their connections. So we're gonna be talking about some science stuff about genus and species and, and, and all of that stuff and genetic mutations. So it'll be a little bit scientific, but mostly it'll be a fun class trying all four of these wines side by side or close to side by side. You don't need four glasses, don't worry. Um, you just uh, one glass per person is totally fine. As I get started, you can go ahead and pour yourself the first wine, which is by Domaine Leon Bosch, and it's La Cabane, and it's a Pinot Blanc here from Alsace, France. So we call this wine an Alsatian wine, but it's from Alsace. So it's not Alsace, and it's not Alsatian. Alsatian wine is from wine from Alsace, France, is how that's pronounced. So go ahead and pour yourself a glass of this as we introduce the theme and uh, the style of the wines uh, and what we're going to be talking. And if you're tuned in li live, I'd love to hear from you in the chat room. If you cannot access the chat room, you probably have to log in with your email address to whatever emails connected to your YouTube account. Not that you need to have a uh, YouTube account, but just uh, whatever email address is uh, connected to it. So I'd love to hear from you. I, I like the chat room because it allows me to feel like I'm actually doing a live in-person-ish class. I get your comments on the wines. I get your, your feedback, your questions. This is the time that when those questions pop up, you don't have to interrupt someone by raising your hand. You know, in those live in-person classes, I have that question and I'm dying to ask it, but I don't want to interrupt anyone by raising my hand in the middle of everything. And so I just write it down and try and remember it or try and remember it. And it never works out like the moment's lost. But with the chat room, you can easily just jot the question down in the chat room and periodically go to the chat room and make sure I've answered all of the questions there. So if you're tuned in live, Go ahead and comment in the chat box uh, where you're coming in from. Hi, Kira again. I'm curious as to what you are drinking out in California. James and Danielle here. I know you're excited about this because y'all love that Pinot Gris that we're going to be featuring. Uh, Brenda, great to see you, Brenda. It's been, I haven't seen you since before, before everything happened. So I'm <laughs> as if like that's the timeline. Like, um, BC, meaning before coronavirus, BCV, and then ACV, after coronavirus. So I haven't seen you since before then. I hope you're doing well. I miss you. I'm seeing you guys in the classes. Aiden, Allen, and Norfa, great to see y'all. I know you also like that um, that Pinot Gris, so super excited to have y'all here. Um, Johnny, Jason, Shane, Andrew, and Lorraine, like the whole crew out on the peninsula, great to see y'all. Um, Amanda and Matt. Oh, and you've got some guests. Fabulous. Wonderful. Brother and sister-in-law. Where do y'all um, hail from, Patrick and Thaddy? Um, and Lisa and Carrollton. Great to see everybody. I, uh, you know, doing these like family, family classes, it's fun to just think about how everything starts and originates. And so doing a little bit of research for this class, I just was struck with the nostalgia of how everything originated with teaching these wine classes in Hampton Roads. So when I when I first moved down here, I started, I was assistant general manager at a, a vintage tavern out here in Suffolk just for a few months. And then I moved to Norfolk and, and became um, eventually their wine director and a general manager out there at a restaurant called Press 626. So much of my start in this community happened at Press and it happened with people coming to the restaurant. I get to know them. They got to know me, and I really got to know their their wine taste. So they'd come in and be like, oh, I have a new wine for you. Pour them a sample, talk all about it. And we started doing wine classes there. And so that's what I fell in love with most. And, and that's how Vino Culture started. I just wanted to really just focus on wine education and 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 seeing some of y'all here in the chat room that I have known since my press days. So just I just got a little nostalgic thinking about the development of the Pinot grape in the family throughout 
um, you know, 10,000 years of history. And I thought about just the last eight years that I've lived in Hampton Roads and how much has developed here. So if you're part of that crew or if you're brand new to that crew or if I've never actually met you and you've just been tuning in virtually, I'm really happy you're part of the Vina Culture Tribe, as I call it, the Vina Culture family. And um, I'd love to get to know you better. So with that being said, let's get started talking about the Pinot family. Now, first, I should, I should probably preface this saying that the class is misnamed, right? Because the Pinot family intimates that there is like two parents and then they have children. Those children have their own children. And so the genetic variations come down through parentage, meaning um, two, genus, uh, two, two subspecies of grapes come together and create crosses or cross variations between other grapes. And those create cross variations between other grapes. So that's what family um, kind of connotates or, or, or envisions in your head. This, we're not actually tasting a family. We're tasting one guy who is so brazen, so self-obsessed that he wanted to just like clone himself into all the variations to do everything that he couldn't do on his own. How many of you feel this? Like, especially now during COVID, you can't work from home, homeschool your kids, clean your house, be a good spouse, see your friends on Zoom regularly, attend these stupid wine classes. Like you can't do it all. You need to clone yourself. You need to have four different Kiras so that one could teach the classes. One could do delivery drivers. One could just drink the wine, right? And uh, one could, one could um, you know, do the healthier things. So that's basically what Pinot Noir did. So Pinot Noir has the most mutations, genetic mutations. So instead of it getting together with another great creating a lot of other grapes that, that create this family dynasty. It's, it has done that, but the three grapes we are going to be tasting are actually just mutations, genetic mutations of the one single grape. So if you did genetic testing of all four of these wines, according to the eight most basic genetic markers, it would come, come back that it was the same grape, Pinot. That's the grape, Pinot. Um, but because Pinot Noir has mutated slightly differently throughout literally centuries, um, throughout thousands of years, it's created multiple different variations. Within those variations, we have different clones. There are over a thousand different clones registered. And by the way, drink this first wine while we're talking about this. This Pinot Blanc is delicious. You don't have to wait for this. We'll talk about it in just a second. I want to introduce just kind of the history of uh, uh, Pinot. As, as, a, as the parent or as the source of all of the wines that we're going to be tasting today. So you don't have to wait. So let's talk real quick about the DNA of grapes. So just like in the animal kingdom, plant kingdoms, you go down, you have the kingdom and then the genus and species finally at the very, very end. So this genus and species that we know of as great vines, think Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Pinot Noir, all that stuff, is Vitus vinifera, or Vitus vinifera, a lot of people say. We don't really know how Latins pronounce the words because uh, <laughs> no one is still around to tell us. But Vitus vinifera or Vitus vinifera, same thing. Those grape vines originated in what's modern day Georgia. We're talking about 8,000, 10,000 BCE is like the earliest archeological evidence that we have of the actual grape pips, the seeds of the grapes that um, are so resilient, they become fossilized. So we can actually do carbon dating on these grape seeds to figure out what was going on. Well, how do we know we were making them into wine? Because there's actual residue on some of these pots or stone enclosures that they can do genetic or they can do testing on now, chemical testing on now to see that, oh, there's a lot of tartaric acid in this. And that is a liquid, I mean, that's, a, that's acid that's produced from the liquid of grapes. And so they're obviously crushing these grapes and they will naturally ferment into wine. So we actually have archeological and chemical evidence that wine was being produced in the area of modern day Georgia, so on the southern part of the Caucasus Mountains, right like uh, below Russia, modern day Russia, from as early as eight to 10,000 BC. So that's real far away. So talk about a history of wine. Now granted, 
the history of wine dates back even further to that. They they think that the cavemen actually had wine, but it was a very quick turnaround process. They pick a bunch of grapes. They're super delicious and sweet, so they give you those carbs, that energy to go hunt. And um, if you pick too many, you have to just put them basically in the ground, probably in a hole somewhere. The juice starts fermenting almost um, within hours. And um, they didn't want anything to go to waste, so of course they drink that. And these cave women were like, oh, my husband, after I drink this juice that tastes terrible, looks a lot more attractive. So I'm going to start doing this more regularly. It's kind of the history of wine. But the history of grapevine cultivation really starts from the specifically the Vitis vinifera um, genus and species. It dates back to 8,000 to 10,000 BC. So... Now from that, we have lots and lots of history of many different empires spreading these grape farms throughout the world. And instead of spread, taking the seeds and spreading them, they're actually taking clippings of the vine and spreading them. It's actually pretty difficult to grow grape vines from the seeds themselves. So the majority of grape vines across the world, even in modern history, are spread throughout uh, by clipping the grape vines themselves and taking those clippings and grafting them, so tying them to roots of other things to allow them to grow. It allows for a quicker turnaround time. So when we think about modern day winemaking, we're thinking about the Phoenicians. We're talking now 600 to 800 BC. And they were the ones who spread the vines from the Mediterranean. So all up on um, the uh, coast of Italy, southern coast of France, southern coast of Spain, up the um, western coast of Spain and Portugal, into even Great Britain. They're taking these grapevine clippings, grafting them throughout there, creating these like little trade villages so that as these seafaring Phoenicians trade around, they can continue to restock the most important part, which is wine, which was used to trade, but also used to just drink and get them through the very long, lonely months of being on the sea. So as we see that, we see what happens in nature and we see microevolution of these grapevines mutating and turning into their own things. So Vitis vinifera or Vitis vinifera, that grapevine mutates very quickly. It adapts very quickly. So if you take a grapevine and plant it, uh, graft it onto one area in sandy soils right by the coast, warm, sunny climate, it's going to create grapes in a certain way to best uh, best survive in that area. If you take that grapevine clipping and take that exact same clipping, so that exact same DNA profile, and move it up to a cool mountain area, so with lots of fog, very little rain, and in rocky <laughs> soils, you're going to have a very different expression of the grapes. So the grapes are going to taste totally different because the vine is very, very, very quick to adapt to any circumstance. So as they're taking these clippings of Vitis vinifera grapevines, spreading them out, we're seeing lots of different variations of the Vitis vinifera grape. So that's what's created basically these parents of grape varieties that we think of. So the Pinot grape variety, um, I think uh, Sauvignon, which is the, the parent of Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, a lot of the classic ones that we know of. All of these kind of parent grape varieties happen as these grape clippings start being grafted all throughout the world um, in very, at a very early time. But no one's doing DNA testing back then. So they just know that the wine tastes good. That's really what they care about. So they're not really caring about which clipping works best in this area. But if you collect this from this area, it tastes different. That doesn't really even happen until we're talking the 1600s is where they start being more intentional about which variety they're using to plant which way. So basically, if you trace it all the way back, all the Vitis vinifera comes from a red grape variety. We don't know what wine from that grape variety would taste like. Uh, we, we have no idea. And from that was born all of what we know of as premium wine. Other grapes exist that, re that aren't part of this family. Think uh, Muscadine and Scupperdong that we have here in the east coast of the United States. Those are not Vitis vinifera. Those are Vitis labrusca, so a different species from the same genus. 
Um, and and it's, it, those are native to the Americas instead of to um, this area in, in, in Georgia. So we, we don't know what originally this wine tastes like, but we know it was red. So all that we know of for all of our premium white grape varieties are literally just genetic mutations of red grape varieties that stopped undergoing what we call verasion. So as green grapes are planted, uh, and, the, and they're grown during growing season. Those, those grapes start out always as green. Every grape starts out as green. And somehow during the process of those grapes ripening fully, the gene of the plant will actually send a signal to the grapevine, which will change the pigment of the grape skins to signal to the birds, hey, we're ready to eat. Like it's, it's dinner time. It's the dinner bell, basically. The darker they get, the more it signals to the birds that these grapes are sweet and really good for eating. Red, green grapes, or white grapes as we think of them, basically are just genetic mutations that just stopped turning red. And so one of the grapes that we're going to try the second one, Pinot Gris, kind of stopped right in the middle. It didn't turn all the way red, but it didn't stop changing color fully. So it's really interesting. So Pinot Blanc, what's in your glass right now, is genetically the same as Pinot Noir according to the eight basic markers. But then if you test according to the hundred more intense markers, then you see the different mm -hmm. mutations. So genetic mutation, not a child of the Pinot family. Now, if you have, if you did any homework in advance for this class and you like did a Google search or YouTube search, people still call it the Pinot family, which is why I called it that for this class. And there is definitely some people, people out there even in the wine like professional community who are still teaching that they're, they're children of Pinot Noir, but in fact, they're just mutations. So that's it. And um, now we're going to talk about more of that mutation stuff as we get along with the wine, but it's really, um, I love the sci-fi feeling of this class, the genetic mutations of this class and adaptability and surviving in these crazy times. So just an interesting interesting uh, class for sure. So thanks for nerding out with me about this. I'll introduce this wine and we'll talk about it. Um, start thinking about your tasting notes. I'd love to hear them in the chat room. So Alsace is the region in France that is right on the border with France and Germany. In fact, it has changed hands, um, not just between France and Germany, but even before that, when there were empires and not necessarily specific countries, 13 different times. So this is like not nomad's land. Everyone wants it. It's just it keeps going back and forth. So it's a really hodgepodge in terms of cultural influence, language influence. So they speak a very different French here. It's more Germanic French and it's more French Germanic than anything. The food is very Germanically influenced. The bottle shape. When else do you see a bottle shape like this? You generally only see this anywhere else in the world in Germany. This long, skinny, thin bottle is called the Riesling bottle. Um, and anywhere else that makes wine in a similar style to Alsace will make their wine and usually bottle in the same thing. So this Pinot Gris that we have, same kind of Riesling style bottle. So we'll talk about why that is when we get to the Pinot Gris. But this is Pinot Blanc. So this is literally genetically the same as Pinot Noir, just eventually stopped turning red throughout Verasion, and then was cultivated as a white grape. So they take clippings from these specific Pinot Blanc vines and now are planting these, grafting these onto other rootstock throughout the whole world because they want to cultivate a white grape variety. Now in Alsace, there are four noble grapes. There are uh, Pinot Gris, uh, Riesling, Gewürztraminer, and Muscat. So, Alsace is really different in that the four most important grapes are all white. Most throughout all of France, there's white and red almost in a 50-50 blend, um, if not leaning more towards red. But in Alsace, 90% uh, of what they make is white, either still or sparkling. About 25% of it is sparkling or cremant de Alsace. But the rest is just regular still white wine. The only red grape they grow there is Pinot Noir. And Pinot Blanc, because it's not one of the four noble grape varieties, has some of the best value. So all of that terroir driven, that intense minerality, that really, really bright fruit characteristics are in there with all the price tag of those noble grape varieties. You can also find some really great values in Alsace because it wasn't fully recognized as a French wine region until after World War II. 
So in the late 40s is when we see the French recognize this as a wine region and they start developing wine rules and start like really narrowing down the focus, like what is this wine all about? So we don't really see the Grand Cru status of these Alsatian vineyards happen until the 70s, actually. So much about 50 years after some of the other prime regions in France. So because of that, because it's later blooming, um, blooming, uh, it's later blooming um, um, uh, notoriety in the French wine world. You can find some really great values. Also because they don't use new oak in this area. So generally speaking, all of their wines are aged in oak, but there are these really old barrels that are taken down and like you go down to these Alsatian cellars, you've done these winding staircases into the cellars and you have this like dank, stony cellars. And that barrel looks like it's older than your grandfather, which it probably is because some of these families have been making wine for 15 or 16 generations. That's how old, that's how historic these vineyards are and these cellars are. And they'll use the same barrel for dozens of years. So the barrel's not actually imparting any oak flavors to the wine. What it's imparting though is a more oxidative style to the wine. So a richer characteristic, a more intense, rounder characteristic that can be really delightful. This area in France also has the most sunlight hours per day of any region in France. Uh, very, very like cloudless days. Like I'm, I'm not talking like partly cloudy. I'm talking like they're surprised when they see a cloud and wonder what got into the sky and what is that white thing. Like that's how sunny the area is because the Vosges mountains kind of act as this rain shadow effect and keep all the clouds on the French side. There's another mountain range on the other side of the Rhine River that keep the um, clouds out on that side. So this valley right in the middle has this incredibly sunny disposition. And, um, but the wines really, so the wines really ripen really well. So you get these fruit forward characteristics. Um, yes, they're Asian oak, but the oak is not the flavor profile that you're getting. You're just getting this richer style. So tell me what you are getting in this Pinot Blanc. And, uh, whew. oh man. My wine is singing now. It's been sitting out here for uh, all this time that I've been chatting about history and genetics. <sighs> Kira, I love it. You're drinking a, uh, a 2018 Cabernet. Well, all right. Sounds good. Tell us how that Cabernet is while we try the like most opposite thing you can get, but I'm, um, I'm curious. Uh, let's see. Amanda says, um, oh, they're from Brazil. Oh, fabulous. Well, I, I got to say. Tell me where I can find some Brazilian wine, because I know they make some really amazing Brazilian wine, especially in the south of Brazil, like on the border of Paraguay and Uruguay. And I have only been able to have like three in my entire life, and they've been really, really delightful. So if you know where I can get some Brazilian wine, please let me know. But super, super great to have you here. So, um, all right. See here, Steve Hill, that's some pop, says I get lots of citrus and green apple and slate on the nose. Yeah, loads of citrus notes, loads of like orchard fruits, so all the apple and pear and peach and apricot that you can kind of think of. And yeah, loads of minerality too, which again is that thing that we don't understand why we can smell and sense and taste minerality. We're not actually tasting rocks, right? But but what are we getting? And, and, and it's definitely something in there, some, some kind of tactile, aromatic thing that smells like wet sidewalks. Um, Tawana says, hello, Tawana. I think this is the first time I've said hello to you. Getting loads of tart yellow apples. Great, fresh squeezed lemon juice. Papa, you gotta, you gotta step up your descriptors. You just can't say apples. You gotta tell me what kind of apples and what condition they are. Um, Tawana's showing you up. Fresh squeezed lemon juice with a nice minerality and hint of something akin to fresh cut grass. So a little bit of like herbaceous growing like organic thing without with, with being like on the greener side. Love that. Um, see, yes, uh, green apple freshness. There is so much freshness to this wine, right? Um, Rick says lots of honeysuckle. Yeah, there's some floral notes in here. And, and... It's like the first floral notes of spring, not, not when it's the great pollenine and everything smells like lilies in the air and it's just, you can't go outside without an inhaler. Um, 
but that, that those first spring flowers that are really kind of delicate and like, ah, are we brave enough to come out? Is it going to frost again? I, I love that. I love that. See, on the palette, I get some herbal notes, maybe rosemary, but not too strong. Okay, there we go. More, more specific way to go. Um, Lisa says, I was worried about my sniffer tonight. Allergies. I know. Uh, it's a uh, it's, uh, bane of my existence as a sommelier. Like, whenever I'm doing blind tastings, I have to like plan out my allergy medication accordingly so I know I can have a good nose before that, before that event. So... Um, slightly buttery, tart green airheads. Oh, okay. Now I gotta taste it. Oh my gosh! Now all I can get is green apple airheads. <laughs> I forgot what those tasted like until I just put that wine in my mouth. Totally, totally agree on that. Um, who? Yeah. Wow. And it's like, to me, it's got this like Snapple peach tea kind of um, quality to the wine. What I love about Pinot Blancs is they've got this silky characteristic, but it's fresh. It's not cloying. It's not silky, like silky and, and sweet and kind of lingers on your mouth too long. The acidity is bright and vibrant. The freshness is there. Um, it's not... It's not overpoweringly acidic, though. It's got this slight creaminess to it, that slight silkiness to it. So Pinot Blanc, Alsatian Pinot Blanc specifically, has been one of my favorite things to pair with Thanksgiving since I first started recommending wine when I didn't know anything. I just tasted a Pinot Blanc. I still remember what the label looks like. I'm 21 years old. I taste this. And I was like, this is what I want with Thanksgiving. This is what I want with turkey. Or I want, I want, I want a wine that lifts the, the intensity of the denseness of flavors of the other things on the table, but I don't want a wine to make the turkey feel drier. And to me, this wine still to this day brings back those memories of, of, of thinking about my first Thanksgiving as a 21-year-old recommending wine to people behind a wine tasting table. Again, not knowing anything. I learned on the job for sure on the floor. Um, if y'all are drinking this with the chef's board, I believe this is paired with the cheddar. Um, the, though so all the, the, the chef's board little tag will tell you specifically. Um, but just so you know, if you're interested in, in what the chef's boards are all about, chef, um, that I've worked with for years, he picks out cheeses to go with each one of the wines that I do for these classes. So for this class, we've got four different cheeses. And it should be the black cow cheddar with that black Gouda, um, that wax coating on it. Don't eat the wax coating. Um, should be the one that would be perfect for this Pinot Blanc. Um, we had a lot of fun tasting a lot of cheese and wine to fig figure these uh, pairings out. So, yes, this does have some oak on it. But as you can tell, we're not getting oak on the flavor of this wine. You're definitely just getting the oxidative style of winemaking instead of reductive style. So when you think stainless steel fermentation and aging, that's reductive. They are eliminating oxygen from the equation, which makes the wine a little bit more intensely austere in its acidity. Doesn't give any of those rounder characteristics to the wine, just a winemaking style and preference. So you often find regions especially in Europe, that the whole region kind of makes wine like this because that's how it's always been done. And you don't go against tradition. Um, so in Alsace, it's very traditional to age all of your wines, including sparkling wines, um, in oak, um, but in very, very, very old oak that's not going to impart the flavor. So we are actually going to go to the second white grape next. Oh, wow. I'm up. I'm going real fast. I'm sorry. I am, um, but we're, we're going to talk more about the genetics, especially when we get to the last two wines. Um, so whenever you're ready, we can go ahead and pour this Ilahi Pinot Gris. And if you're doing it with the cheese pairing, you want that Gouda, that, I mean, not Gouda, that really good is what I meant to say, but Gouda came out of my mouth. That really good funky cheese, that Ribiola, um, that soft uh, ash, bloomy rind cheese. Um, the, the funkiness of that cheese with this Pinot Gris is one of the best pairings I've had in recently. So if you're doing it with that, make sure you get the right cheese with it. 
So Ilahi Pinot Gris, now we're gonna go to Oregon. And as you taste this wine, just go ahead and pour yourself a glass whenever you're ready. Don't chug down the next one, the last one and go to the next one until you're ready. Um, whenever you're ready. Let's talk about how these grapes transitioned. So, oh, one other thing I forgot to say when we were talking about the misnomer of the Pinot family, because that, that connotates that there's Pinot Noir or Pinot, and then it had children rather than just mutations, just kind of like side shoots. So one of the ways that they know that they're mutations that aren't just um, children is because on a certain vine, you can actually have striped grape varieties. You can have a grape that, that has stripes of white, gray, pink, and red on it. I, I need to see this before I die, and I need to taste this zebra wine. Like, I, I, I just need to have this in my life. I, 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 it's, just a, it's just a thing that's going to have to happen. So I'm going to travel all around the world as soon as we can start traveling again, and we are going to try this, and I'm going to bring back bottles for you all to try, if I can get some bottles of zebra wine, because that's the most amazing thing I've heard since last Saturday when we talked about aliens not being able to legally land their spaceships in the vineyards of Chateau Neuf de Pop. So <laughs> Pinot Gris is a is a is an oddball because the Pinot grape, the Pinot Noir grape, has five, sorry, no, has three um, 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 oh my gosh, pigment genes in it. So most red grapes have five. Um, Pinot Noir only has three. That's why it's generally such a pale colored, such a, such a translucent, such a, um, such a, um, lightly concentrated pigmented wine because it only has three, um, uh, pigment colors in it. Pinot Gris mutated from Pinot Noir and it lost two of them, but it kept one. So it didn't go fully to white like Pinot Blanc did. It kept one on there. And so if you let the grapes hang out on the vine long enough, then what you find is they turn this grayish or peachish color, sometimes pink, sometimes almost as dark as the Pinot Noir grape, which turns this black color. Very, very like um, not red or purple, almost just straight up black color. Um, and Pinot Gris has just one of those pigments in it. And uh, so it didn't lose all of them. And as they, as they found this, they just discovered that it had this like really beautiful characteristic to it. They loved it. They planted it specifically in Alsace. While they found it in, in uh, Burgundy, they brought it to Alsace as they're kind of like intentionally cultivating the region and trying to grow grapes there and, and start civilization there. And it did really well there. And it created these like really beautiful, aromatic, pungent wines that still were fermented dry, but just did really well. And just kind of that step in between like a white wine and a red wine, but without the color necessarily. Because what they'll do is they press the juice off the skins of the grape almost immediately. And so you still get white wine from it, even though the grape skins are pretty pigmented. The only way you're gonna get pigment in it is if you let the juice hang out or macerate on the skins for a little bit longer, and then you can get this peachish hue to it. They, they started doing this specifically and intentionally in, in Italy, in this village of Ramato. And so from there on out became the Ramato style of this Pinot Gris made in almost this peachish hue or pinkish coloring, not quite rosé, sometimes even darker than rosé, um, because they let the juice hang out on the skins of the grape for a little bit longer. So that's all about Pinot Gris. It came to Italy, so Pinot Gris meaning Pinot, the actual grape, and then gris, the French word for gray, because that's what color the grapes turn if you, if you pick them at the same time. It travels onto Italy, where it is, and um, this, this really intense, and it was a 20 minute long video. I'm, I'm trying hard not to say like that, but um, grape just traveled down, and they made it in a very different style. So instead of making it in the Alsatian style, because it was one of the Grand Cru grapes, remember, of Alsace, France, 
Fantastic, in the 30s or 40s, 1930s or 40s, but into the 60s and 70s is when it starts going up in terms of production. It has its like ultimate heyday, mid 1980s, where every single woman in America wanted a glass of Pinot Grigio. And, um, and, and so it became very popular there. The style was made totally differently. So instead of the oxidative style, they made it to be so stainless steel and they're so fully green. They have a brighter, younger, fresher. So you the tart, Bernie Smith green apple notes in the wine that's like one line. Like it tastes like the color green. And because they're not using any oak at all or allowing any oxygen to influence the wine, it's keeping all of that intensity and freshness of the wine. So that's how they made it, and it became this just staple of American society and restaurants and households across all of America is really where it became famous, and then started traveling to other places. Um, since then, um, that style kind of became ubiquitous for like $5 wine that you get at the grocery store. And so because it became so famous and so sought after, people plant for quantity, not quality. And so, yes, there are really amazing Pinot Grigio producers, especially, especially in the Alto Adige region of Italy. But generally speaking, Pinot Grigio is like synonymous for cheaper style of white wine, just how it, how it evolved on the global market. Um, I've had some really amazing Pinot Grigio stuff. So if you have had those cheaper examples and hate them, don't be dismayed. Like Pinot Grigio is actually a thing that's super, super, super delicious, especially in that Peter style, that Romato style, that skin contact style that uh, uh, Italy became um, uh, developed uh, in the seventies. But this right here, so as as the grape Pinot Gris is grown throughout the world. Remember, this is just a mutation of Pinot Noir. As this grape is grown throughout the world, producers decide to either call it Pinot Noir in which they produce the grape. So in style, aged in these huge oak barrels that are untested oak is old, so it's also not imparting those oak tannins to the wine. It's just created in that oxidative style which creates this like round texture, this honeyed texture, this more like intense, opulent, um, richer style rather than that bright. So the grapes are developing more bright, natural brightness and sweetness. To think that this wine has some residual sugar, just, I mean, it smells like honey drizzled over graham crackers with some flowers sprinkled on top and pineapple. So you might think, oh, this wine is going to be sweet. You might even taste it and think that this wine is sweet. But it doesn't actually have residual sugar to the wine. Um, it, it's just the sweetness of the actual fruit, the ripeness of the fruit that they pick it. Because instead of picking it young, like in style, time style, they're picking it with longer hang times. So the grapes have developed more natural sugar. Cool. So that is, that's Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio history. I want, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this wine. No, you're not really a white wine drinker though, right? No, I like Um, If you're not a white wine drinker and you're tasting a couple of these wines, I am super curious what you think about these two wines because they are mutations of the Pinot Noir grape. What are, the, what are they doing for your soul? What's happening? Um, let's see, Kit says he's getting honeysuckle. Totally, totally, totally. Yes, Tawana says, I'm currently cooking fried chicken nuggets with wine number one paired really well. That's, that sounds amazing. Um, um, great question. Rick says, is Pinot Chardonnay one of the mutations? No, that's actually one of the children. So we'll take a quick do detour while you're having your tasting notes on this wine. Let me just show you my favorite in the whole world called Wine Grapes. Um, by Jancis Robinson and two co-authors. This will trump any information you can find on Google. So it's the only place I get information about specific grapes, especially genetic parenting and all that stuff. It's the nerdiest book in the entire world, though. It will also run you like $200. So I don't recommend it unless you're like 
studying wine is your thing, not drinking wine, but studying wine. So as I am trying to find this, okay, great. So now I've got to find it. Okay, here is this fold out. This is the family tree of Pinot and uh, anything that it has created in the world. So if you can see here, this right here is Pinot. This right here is Gouache Blanc. Pinot and Gouache Blanc are responsible for producing Chardonnay. That's one of the children of Pinot, black grape, Gouache Blanc, white grape. Produced Chardonnay is one of the actual children. So that's not a genetic mutation that is truly part of the Pinot family dynasty. Um, but meanwhile, Pinot is over here hanging out with Savignon too on the side. So is Gouache Blanc. I mean, it's getting real racy throughout here. And um, what else is Savignon from? Um, Merlot. So really, really fascinating. Isn't really hanging out anymore. Um, but Savignon is in small cases, but Pinot definitely is. So Pinot hung out the longest, surprisingly so, because he is real finicky, very disease prone, um, and um, just always getting sick. <laughs> but for whatever reason, created these most, most, some of the most amazing wines ever on the planet. So, all right, let's see here. Um, I think I've, uh, Tawana, you're totally right. I do need eventually a moderator. So we're going to talk here about um, about these. So um, Pinot Gris tastes like green nap skins. Okay. So it has that similar characteristic of Pinot Grigio, right? Those apple notes, but you get more of the skin qualities rather than like the juicy fruit qualities. Interesting. So more buttery than the last was baked apple. Yes. I loved that baked apple call. Way go. Don't care for number two. I mean number one, but number two is definitely something I enjoyed. Fabulous. Hard to me find hard for me to find a white wine that I like, but you did it with number two, which is great because y'all have a couple bottles of this now. So um Sam Pop says the palate is so much smoother and it does taste sweet, even though the sugar test says there is no individual sugar. But are concentrated on the tip of your tongue. So if you stick just the tip of your tongue into the wine, that's all. Don't bring the wine. You concentrate on the feeling of the tip of your tongue and feel if you taste sweetness. So if you try that with this wine, you're very curiously surprised that I don't taste any sweetness on the tip of my tongue at all. It tastes um, bitter and acidic. And when I take a whole gulp of the wine, Say well because that's what I'm about to do. It feels like there is a sweetness to the wine, so it is. Um, it is one of my most favorite wines, <clears throat> Pinot Gris styles, because of that 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 juxtaposition of taste sweet but it's dry. So, see, Tawana says this one is less intense than wine number one. Going for hints of peach candy rings, yes, on the top of the citrus, um, and something with a touch of caramelization, maybe brown sugar. Yes, that is coming from these old oak barrels that the wine is aged in. I love it. Brown sugar, yes. Um, Amanda Spen says, we like number one and number two for a really hot day. Yeah, they're refreshing. Even though affected based on the aroma, yes, this is a little bit of a surprising wine. Not wrong, the first couple years I sold this wine. I've been selling their Pinot Gris, their Rosé, and their Pinot Noir for years. So I always said Elahi, but it's Ilahi. So it's uh, more Celtic, um, I guess, in, in if I remember correctly, but I could be wrong on that. So Ilahi is the name of the producer, and it's their estate Pinot Gris from Willamette Valley, Oregon. They produce just a small amount of this. They only have three estate acres planted to Pinot Gris and one acre of vineyards that they source from somewhere else. So all of their pin Pinot Gris is produced just from four acres of wine, I mean, of vines. And it's um, really fascinating. I love their wines, though. Oregon Pinot Gris is super delightful. So is Alsatian Pinot Gris. Can't go wrong. But Pinot Gris is like the white grape of Oregon. Um, rightfully so, because Pinot Noir is the red grape. So speaking of red grapes, who here is excited to try 
Pinot Meunier and Pinot Noir. Um, if you are ready, we're gonna go ahead and start pouring um, the Pinot Meunier. This is by Darting. So Darting is a producer in the Faults region of Germany. So we're first south in Germany. Um, instead of like right across the border from Alsace and you get to the bottom area of Germany, we're actually going further south to that, so a little bit more to the fault. So that's how it's pronounced. So pretend the P is not there, um, and there's a T in between the L and the Z, and then you got it, faults. Um, like my parents like to pick out my faults. <laughs> Sorry, I always got to give a joke to my parents while they're sitting across me. So faults region of France is where we will start now. I like to serve uh, Meunier in Pinot Noir glasses. And the reason why Pinot Noir has a specific shape of glass like this versus this is a classic red wine grape. I mean, sorry, red, um, oof, red wine glass. Because most red wines are more uh, higher in alcohol content. Their viscosity is higher. And so it needs a little bit more of that evaporation to happen. Also, most of the aromatics profiles, the specific chemical compounds, red wines, those, those esters are more intense and they need that alcohol evaporation to become volatile, become aromatized, to become vaporized so that you can smell them. So you need a more straight up glass to kind of allow for more of that evaporation to happen um, to create more of the aromatics. Pinot Noir, and thus Pinot Meunier as a red variation of Pinot Noir, has usually a tapered glass because they are usually lower in alcohol content and also have more delicate aroma molecules in the actual wine. So you want that about to happen and you need it them to put themselves, you need a bigger dance floor, you need more batteries to kind of capture them in the top of the glass. So as this wine is opening up, the dance floor is big, allowing them to express them, but it's kind of concentrating those more delicate aromatic profiles to your nose. So that is why Pinot Noir glass is shaped with a huge wide bowl, but a tapered top versus a typical red wine glass. And I serve my white wines and red wine glasses for tastings um, is more straight up. It's a slight taper. It's not out like a martini glass but only a slight taper. So if you were curious about why I switched glasses, that's why. Um, let us check out this color on this wine. So if you hold the wine on its side, kind of look straight down through it. If you have a white piece of paper with, uh, with notes on it, then you can do it that way. Um, and notice that how, first of all, pale in concentration this coloring is, this pigment is, I can easily read through this wine. So the concentration is very light. The coloring itself is almost quintessentially what we call garnet in the wine world. So typically in the wine world, wine professionals will use three colors to describe red wines. Um, ruby, which is super, super bright red, obviously. Purple, which is more of those bluish undertones. And garnet, which is like this, has those brownish undertones. So noir as a grape, has more brownish pigments in it. Maybe it actually has the same brownish pigments. As the it only has three of the five, but the brown it shows itself a little bit more. It's not shy by the by the other pigments. I'm smelling this wine or smelling and taking should smell first. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Pinot Meunier. Thank you, I'm so excited to drink this wine. It's really kind of like mun. Yay, but you know, just, uh, just work with me here and just uh, pretend you're French and, and, and we'll get there. So Pinot Meunier, genetic variation of Pinot Noir, kept the pigment of Pinot Noir, slightly different variation, that's all. Um, it's often actually, um, I guess it was, it was cultivated throughout France in, in the Burgundy region, and Champagne is above Burgundy to the north of Burgundy. Pinot Meunier is really interesting because it's usually blended into sparkling wines to make Champagne. So Champagne, there's three of the most prolific grapes are Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, child of Pinot Noir and Sauvignon. I mean, sorry, Pinot Noir and Gouache Blanc. 
and Pinot Meunier. So those are the three classic grapes of Champagne. There's another four grapes that are technically allowed. So there's seven total allowed. The very few producers, I'm talking like less than five that I can think of, produce any of those four grapes. So the three grapes of Champagne that you need to know are Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, the two black grapes, and Chardonnay, the white grape. Pinot Meunier is a really interesting addition to the blend because while those wines tend to not age as long because Pinot Meunier has a little bit softer acidity, it adds this fruit and, and fun characteristic to the wine, this little bit softer note to the wine that makes the wines really approachable. Champagne can be really austere. I'm not talking about any sparkling wine. I'm talking about Champagne from the Champagne region of France, true Champagne. They can be pretty austere because the acidity level is so high that they can just be very difficult to enjoy when you drink them young. But Pinot Meunier adds this like rounder approachability. It's almost like, you know, you hang out with that coworker after work and they're just like, even after work, all they're doing is talking about work and you're like, loosen up a little bit. Maybe like two tequila shots in, they're like finally talking about their weird hobbies of knitting beanie, but, be, 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 beanie babies, whatever it is. <laughs> the, the, that tequila shot is Pinot Meunier to Champagne. It kind of loosens up Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, makes them a little bit more approachable at a younger age. So I really enjoy champagnes that have higher levels of Pinot Meunier in them because I like that roundness if I'm not going to age the wine. So just a, just a note there. Very few people actually produce red varietal Pinot Noirs. So when I say varietal, I mean the grape variety itself is not blended with any other grapes. It's 100% that one varietal. All four wines that we're having tonight are varietal wines. They're not blended. Very few people produce a red varietal Pinot Meunier. But this one right here from Darting is one of my favorites. I have, um, again, I've actually featured this wine, I think for about six years now, and since I first fell in love with them. It is imported by Skernik. So on the back here, right here, you see uh, Skernik wines. I'm always telling people, when you fall in love with a wine, look at the back, especially if it's an imported wine, look at the back and see who it's imported by. Generally speaking, you can start falling in line with the palettes of certain importers. So I have I have never had a wine that was imported by Skernik that did not blow my mind. So uh, in, in, in different levels, from life-changing experiences to this just made my day. But all of their wines are really phenomenal and highly recommend. So whenever you're drinking wines that are from a different country, turn to the Mac if you really enjoy them or really hate them. So you kind of know like, oh yeah, it's another Skernik wine. Funny how that is, the last few Skernik wines I've always really enjoyed. So then when you're shopping somewhere, you can turn the wines around and just pick out a Skernik wine and chances are you might really enjoy it. So Trocken, by the way, uh, right on the bottom here, Trocken just means dry. So <laughs> Alb Trocken means off dry or half dry is what it translates to, but Trocken just means dry. So this wine is dry, it's no sweetness left in the wine, and is how I described it when I was when I was talking about Pinot Meunier, I was characterizing all of these wines like they were family members. Right, so uh, I can't wait till I get to Pinot Noir, but Pinot Meunier is like the family member who shows up so infrequently to family gatherings that you and you never know whether or not they're going to show up. He always rolls up on a motorcycle, um, always kind of got a different girl on his arm, rolls his own cigarettes kind of thing, and um, yeah, it's uh, this like rustic romantic type, and um, there's like this, always this earthiness to it. It's not as composed. It's not as elegant as any of the other family members. Um, but it's definitely got this je ne sais quoi about it that is, uh, is just really fun. And um, yeah, so that is Darting Pinot Meunier. And if you, if you ever get a chance to try, there's a producer out in California that I know makes Pinot Meunier that is at least available here in Virginia. It's the only producer in California that I know, Sidori, um, and their Pinot Meunier is super delightful also. So 
whenever you get a chance to try a red Pinot Meunier, still not sparkling, go for it. Because I've only had, I think, five in my entire life. So, um, so go for those wines because they're, you know, once in a lifetime kind of chances. So, all right. What do you all think about this Pinot Meunier here? <sighs> Speaking of which, uh, what is Meunier? So Meunier is the French word for Miller. Um, and they call it the Miller Pinot because the great uh, leaves, the vines, on, the leaves on the vines themselves have this like white kind of hairs on the bottom of them to capture yeast or I, I don't know what, what the purpose is for them. You have to ask the vine. But those white hairs, if you turn them over, it looks like flour was sprinkled on the bottom of the leaf. So the French started calling it the Miller Pinot because it, you know, flour miller, someone who's milling flour. So it looked like flour. If you turn the, the leaf upside down, flour has spilled everywhere. So that's that's the that's the history of the grape word itself. So mom, what do you think about Pinot Meunier? Know, it's surprising. It's got a surprise flavors to it. Good surprise mm -hmm. or bad surprise? Good, very good, yes. Okay, she said it was surprising, but she didn't say if it was good or bad, so. Um, all right, this, um, wow, all right. So Pinot Meunier is interesting because it has all of the acidity that's natural to Pinot Noir, maybe just slightly lower. A little bit more of this fruit characteristic, a little bit more alcohol, so it buds later than Pinot Noir and is harvested and it ripens fully earlier. So it has a shorter growing period. So you're never going to have the same complexity or austerity that you get with Pinot Noir, but it's super delightful. It's a, it's a, it's a fun weekend rather than a lifetime commitment kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so um, that's, 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 that's it. It's a, it just adds a different component to the wine too. What makes it great as a blending grape and what whites use as a blending grape so much is it's not as disease prone as Pinot Noir is. And because it ripens later, I mean, ripens earlier and buds later, you don't have the same um, issues with spring frost, frost and fall frost. So not only is it more disease resistant, it also doesn't have the same fears about frost um, so you don't have to worry about it so say i'm planting i'm in champagne and i have pinot noir chardonnay and pinot Meunier, pinot Meunier planted all together an early frost could kill off quite a bit of my pinot noir frost so that means that year i'm gonna have a fruitier wine because i'm gonna use a little bit more pinot Meunier than i would normally um pinot noir because i have a lower crop uh, of that so it provides a little bit more of um, agricultural stability, financial stability to these farmers that are making it. So, all right, let's see here. I'm uh, going to read the comments. I'm super far behind. Um, I think I spilled my cherry Coke on the fresh cut hay bale. Okay, I like it. All right. Tawana challenge accepted from Sampa. He has gone above his tasting. No, no. Let's see what you got, Tawana. I'm not competitive at all. Um, let's see. Um, not that I know of. So, um, uh, yes, PMA is known as Muller Rib. Um, and also misleadingly Schwartz Riesling. So if you've ever had a Schwartz Riesling, it was actually Pinot Meunier, um, not a type of Riesling. Um, so it's Mullerhead and Schwartz Riesling. Of the couple German producers that I have tasted from, I've only seen it labeled as Pinot Meunier, but maybe local bottlings would call it um, Mullerhead or Schwartz Riesling. So great. See, Tuan said, da, 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 smells like horse saddle. All right, so we got some Britannomyces. Does anyone else get some of this uh, horsiness to the wine? Um, a little bit, yeah. There's a little bit of this like leathery, earthy component. I get mostly like the tobacco sidings, which is why I was like, this guy rolls his own cigarettes because it's like fresh tobacco, like pipe tobacco. Um, but I also, yeah, I could be convinced to, um, to go another. Um, let's see you email me about about the next one we're going to taste I haven't had no time but we'll get
back to you on that is a curious question. See, Rick says darker red, a bit of rust chewiness. Yeah, so that's a great Pinot Noir. It's true. Pinot Meunier was never meant to be life-changing wine, um, but it is delicious nonetheless. Um, Let's see, don't think I should ride my motorcycle too soon after a glass of the Meunier. Okay, fabulous. Um, what is the alcohol percentage on this? We're only at 13.5, so we're actually uh, pretty pretty light these days. Um, used to be high alcohol content, but now these days it's light. Um, Kit said, uh, taking a bite of something peppery makes it much fruitier. Um, interesting. So I always like the juxtaposition. Whenever you have a really earthy wine, if you pair it with something even earthier, it makes the earthiness go away and the fruitiness come out in the wine. So to me, anytime there's something that I don't necessarily love in the wine, but it's a slight component, say I don't like, say I don't like the fruit. Um, say it's a really, it's a super fruity wine. It's just like a jam in the glass. I'll pair it with something sweeter, which will make the wine seem drier than it actually is or, or less fruity. So I like I like that style of uh, food pairing. So great. Um, see, some mom says the word fuzzy underside of the leaf is glabrous. Glabrous? Mm -hmm. That's the like scientific term of the fuzzy Any. side of the underneath of the leaf? Any leaf. Any leaf, mm -hmm. like tree or plant mm -hmm. or anything. Glabrous. That's how it's pronounced. Mm -hmm. Glabrous. Okay. Well, we all learned something new, glabrous. So the Pinot Meunier leaf is very glabrous, and um, I love it. That's great. That's why I have a biologist for a mother and an uh, IT guy for a father. I get to learn all of these things for these classes. So, um, all right. So let's now get to the wine that I probably will we'll probably spend the most time like analyzing, discussing the tasting notes of the wine. I don't think that there's ever been a time that I've finished a class early, but I think tonight might be the class, which is crazy because I had so much to talk about. So um, whenever you're ready, we will, we need a glass class. You know, I have, right before COVID happened, I was planning um, a Riedel glass class. So Riedel is the brand of glasses that I use through these crystal glasses. And we were going to do, you know, six different types of glasses multiple different types of wine. We pour the same wine in all of the glasses. So you really see how differently the wines react to the different glasses that, that they're in. I believe most things in the wine world are gimmicks. Um, glassware is not a gimmick. And the Coravin is not a gimmick. Um, those two things are worth investing in. Everything else, to me personally, I'd rather spend my money on wine. Um, but glassware is really is, is definitely not a gimmick, and I highly recommend investing in some good glasses. Mm -hmm. You don't have to get eight mm -hmm. different types of glasses. You don't have to have a storage unit like I do for all of your cases. Um, it, just getting a couple good glasses um, is, is so worth it, um, especially if you don't have kids that might break them or something because the good glassware is always more breakable. Um, all right, so whenever you're ready, we're going to go on to this next one. This is from Burgundy, France. It is imported by Rosenthal, another really brilliant producer. I mean, not producer, a brilliant um, um, importer. Whew, losing my um, losing my words here. Um, by Edmund Cornu et Fee. So um, F I L S in sons. That's why you'll see and sign or either that or the French word for and, which is E T. Um, F-I-L-S, because it's usually this family generation, so it starts as Edmund Cornu, and then it turns into Edmund Cornu et Fee, or um, Sons, so it's pronounced just F-I, Fee, or F-E-E -E is how that's pronounced. So pour yourself a glass of the Burgundy. If you do have two glasses and you want to go back and forth between the Pinot Meunier and the burgundy that is super fascinating, um, but it's not gonna do the Pinot Meunier justice, right? It's gonna make the Pinot Meunier taste like, well, why was I even drinking that? So it is It is. It is definitely a, we'll, we'll showcase the Pinot Noir in that side by side pairing, but not do the Pinot Meunier justice. So let's, I'm gonna get back to what Pinot is all about. So Pinot Noir, is is the original, right? It's the OG 
of the Pino mutations and the family members. Um, Pinot Noir has over 2,000 years of recorded history on it. So we have we have we have great vines being planted and, and wine being made again, remember, since caveman days. But in terms of intentional production, intensive intentional cultivation, we're looking at way more recent history. So the Phoenicians at uh, 800 to 600 BC were, were the ones planting the grapes. So the seafaring um, um, small empire, I don't know what the word for that is, and they, they were tradesmen and they were all about boats. So anywhere that could be accessed by boats in the areas that they they traveled, um, they set up these small communities, trade posting villages and communities to grow grapes, to not only trade, but also to drink. Um, and so they are going up the Rhine River. So up from um, Southern France on the Mediterranean, up the Rhine River into Germany. And as they're being planted there, then the Greeks, the Greek empires and the Roman empires, not the Romans, sorry, the Greek empires and the, oh my gosh, I for, I'm forgetting my history, what happened after the Greeks? Anyways, other people were in charge and then other people were in charge. And as those other people were in charge, they continued the cultivation of these vines throughout more inland regions of France. So back into basically, we're looking at now early, early AD, we're looking at the cultivation of grapevines into the more inland regions of France. But it really wasn't until the Catholic Church and their intentional cultivation of grapes through the monasteries that we see a focused intellectual discussion about how these vineyards are managed and how the grape vines are tended and how the wine itself was made and used. So we see people recording what's working best and when to harvest, how to prune, how far apart to displace the plant. And it becomes more organized and more intentional. We're talking in like the 1100s. Definitely more into the 13, 14, 15th centuries. Now we're getting way more intellectual about it as we understand more of the science about it. But still, we don't even know up until then what pasteurization was, what fermentation is even doing. We just understand that when you mash the grapes up like this and leave them for a certain time and strain the juice off those skins, it tastes good and it gets you drunk. And if you follow these steps, it'll taste better than if you follow those steps. That's really that's really kind of the extent of what we understood. But as we go on in history, as we start developing into the you know 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, now we start understanding the science of how these, how the vines are actually reacting and how if you do this scientifically, what's happening in the vine itself and why that's making the grapes taste different. And when the grapes taste this way, the wine tastes this way. And if I collect the grapes from over here, even if I do it the same thing to these vines over in this vineyard that I do to these vines over in this vineyard and I make the wine the same way, it tastes different. Thus was born the idea of terroir. So terroir that impossible to pronounce and definitely much even harder to um, define French word terroir basically just means sense of place. And so it's really the, the, this idea of terroir, this idea of sense of place, it's really developed and kind of honed in in Burgundy. So Burgundy is a very cold region in France, like very cold and blink. Like you think of our falls here and our falls and winters, like what we've had, this just gray skies and rainy days and chill in the air, but not enough to snow, this frustrating. Um, that's, that's Burgundy a lot of the time. So it makes these really stunning wines, but definitely is um, an austere place to live. It's great for Pinot Noir though, because Pinot Noir is a thinner skin grape, is more delicate grape, doesn't do well in hotter climates like Cabernet Sauvignon does or Tempranillo or a lot of other red grapes do much better in hotter, drier, more intense conditions, more struggling conditions. This does well in like, this is the person who wants to live in London. You know, this is this is like, and they just want to be depressed all of the time. Um, they, they, they like the the bleak, dreary days, because it ripens, I mean, because it buds early, 
one of the earliest of the red grape varieties, and it ripens early, it needs this longer growing season to get the most out of the complexity of the wine. Because the wine is delicate, right? No Pinot Noir should ever scream at you. It's never going to be that opulent. Pinot Noir is never going to be in your face, bold and obtuse. Um, Pinot Noir is way more delicate. That uh, that quiet delicacy that's so and um, and and truly almost as as a lot of wine professionals will call the great haunting uh, sometimes the 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 flip style of Pinot Noir you don't get that if it's, the grape ripens too early it shuts off the the developing of, developing of all of that complexity and you just get one note in wines. That's why Pinot Noir is so expensive, unfortunately. It's one of the most or uh, frost or literally anything it's sensitive to. It's like the millennial uh, who's uh, overly sensitive about everything and is just always upset all the time. It also very much expresses the terroir and vintage variations. So say it's slightly cooler, which I know one degree average cooler this vintage than the other. That wine will taste dramatically different, even if everything else is the same. Say the winemaker decides to use 15% new oak instead of 13% new oak one day. The wine will taste dramatically the same. It's so reactive. Um, and so sensitive that of all the family members, this is why the Pinot Noir spends the most time mirrors that back out. Um, uh, it's it's a, a late spring mood, or so a little a leaf hoppers rolling, or leaf roll virus. You could you could have any of these things that could kill off your frost. I mean, kill air crop well, so it reacts to every mess. I think they don't like Pinot Noir because like, ah, it just all tastes like watered down wine to me. But when you try these wines that express all of the best things out of the struggle of their lives, they can, they can truly change your idea of what wine is supposed to be in your life. Um, they, they, they are truly just, um, they grip your heart in a, in a different way. So that's why Pinot Noir, certain wines you have to pay to play. And that is often happens with Pinot Noir. So as you're tasting, curious of your thoughts, um, throw them in the chat room. I will talk about the difference, major difference between California and Burgundy, uh, Pinot Noir expressions. So Burgundy is much cooler and much, um, much cooler with much less sunlight. Sunny California ripens that California fruit in a way that Burgundy could only ever dream. But that's why Burgundy, generally speaking, you wait years and years um, of cellar time before you open them up, and then they're truly amazing versus California, that fresher fruit but less acidity. Those wines are meant to be consumed tender. In the last 10 years especially, we've seen California producers really focus more on making a European style of Pinot Noir, and we've seen French producers really focus on making a more modern style of Pinot Noir. So we're seeing a balancing of the scales, um, but but classically, those are the two big differences. Also, the big difference is if you make Pinot Noir in France, if you're calling it Burgundy and it's red, it has to be 100% Pinot Noir from those regions. You can't add a drop of any other grape from any other region and still call it Burgundy Rouge. Um, if you are making your wine in California, depending on the specific region, you could be blending 15 to 25% other grapes from any other region on earth and still call it Pinot Noir from that area. Um, the most you could blend would be 25% up to, uh, or, or based on the specific. So I'd be calling it a Carneros Pinot Noir and 15% of it could be Syrah from Chile and I'm still calling it Carneros Pinot Noir and you the wine buyer will never know the difference because I'm not legally um, so I, I, I'm not legally bound to disclose that information. Um, in fact winemakers you could tour the actual winery and they'll still swear up and down that that's 100% Pinot Noir from that region. So um, so you have a very different style, this juicier, fruitier style of Pinot Noir from California. You generally don't see colors as pale in concentration as you do this wine. Um, also, what they're doing is um, in California, stylistically, because 
are looking for that modern, more opulent expression of the fruit. You centrifugal force to extract out excess water molecules from the wine, basically like spinning it around like a, a washing machine, to further extract more intense, more flavorful. So, just know that they are, they are made in very different steps. I'm not here to say one is better than the other. I am always here to teach you the history help you develop your own palette and help you hopefully expand that palette over time. Um, so it's a stylistic difference in wine and a winemaking practice. You know, the French have been making Pinot Noir in this way for thousands of years. California have been making it for less than 75 in this way. So there's just a lot of innovation that comes with not being burdened by the tradition of the old world. Um, but it also means that, um, the wines are just very different styles. So that's the huge differences. But again, like I said, those balances are being equal as more um, new world producers are making wine in an old world style and more old world style produce or old world producers are making wine in a more new world style. So I can't just get, I, I just can't get enough of the smell of this wine. It's so aromatic. It's so fragrant. It's so perfumed. This to me is the example of of why it's worth spending a little bit of extra money on a Pinot Noir. Um, haven't tasted it yet. So i um, curious your, uh, your notes here on these wines. Let's see, um, I think these are the notes on this. Ripe strawberries, yes, picked on a warm day, absolutely. And like wild strawberries too. They have this like brambly characteristic to them. Really enjoy that. Um, see, cherry pie with slivered almonds on top. Like that call. Great. On the palate. Wow, this is why I married your mother, Kira. I'm basic. <laughs> okay. I, I'm confused. Y'all didn't drink wine when y'all first got married, so. But this romance. Romance. The romance of it all. all okay, right. great. The next statement. Full body yeah. but fresh fruits, perfect acidity. Okay. <laughs> It'll be a lot of fun when we can do it. I plan on throwing a huge party when we can when we can finally do that. Way of saying winemakers, because there is no term for winemaker because they don't consider themselves winemakers. They consider themselves first and foremost vine tenders, vignerons. Um, so yes, they're making the wine too, but they're making the wine in the vineyards. They call themselves vignerons before they'll call themselves winemakers. Oh, and you just it. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Oh, this is, that was wonderful. They express the unique terroir. Absolutely perfectly. When I was in Oregon, um, let's see, about a year and a half ago, I went to Oregon to work at Patricia Green Cellars and make a bunch of Pinot Noir. And I learned how sensitive this grape is. So they um, they do what's called pigeage, and see if I can demonstrate this. Bit. But so you, when you pick the grapes, they go in these big vats or tanks, and either whole cluster with the stems included sometimes, or de-stemmed through a machine, and the grapes just get piled up. And usually Pinot Noir. To get that level of extraction and flavor, you need what's called a cold soak or a cold maceration. And so for about four or five days, the grapes either get, get stirred or, or somehow mixed with the, the juice and the skins all together. But for four or five days, you put dry ice on it to make sure it stays too cold so it doesn't start fermenting. So natural yeast will start fermenting above 47 degrees Fahrenheit. So you want to keep it below that temperature, like between 35 and 40 optimally. You don't want it to freeze, but you want it to be cold enough so that no yeast will start fermenting. And during that five days of it being stirred, you're extracting more of the phenolics, more of the flavor profiles, more of the colors and pigments from the grape skins themselves before the wine starts fermentation, which can last for two to four weeks. So Pinot Noir skins though, Pinot Noir itself, because it's more delicate, it doesn't want too much tannins. So the tannins come from the skins and the seeds of the grape, the stem, the oak that the wine was aged in, 
Well, if you get too much tannins in there, it's gonna overpower the delicacy of the grape itself. So while most people during this process of fermentation and that cold soak, most winemakers for other grapes will use this big metal plate that has holes in it like a colander with a pole attached to it. And you'll stand on the side of these big tanks that are about five feet tall and you'll push down with this plate, you'll push down the cap, which is all the skins that rise to the top as the juice kind of soaks out of the skins. So just like your ice rises to the top, imagine that, that cap is all of the grape skins. Well, you don't want the skins to dry out because then you'll get these really raisinated flavors in your wine that's not good. So you need to, throughout the day, multiple times a day, stir <laughs> the cap, push down the cap to make sure the cap is, is still wet, still interacting with the juice of the, of the, of the must of the, of that, in that tank. Well, those metal plates that you would use anywhere else of any other grape can sometimes be too rough on the Pinot Noir skins and break them in a way that will release harsh tannins to the wine. So when I was out at Patricia Green's, now not every winemaker believes in this strategy, but Patricia Green Winery was all about it. They do what's called pijage, which is the human stirring of these things. So you don't use a metal pole because the metal pole can break and tear the skins to the point where you're extracting those green, harsh tannins. Everyone's had that wine, which just like tastes like oversteep tea in your mouth. It's just bitter. It's not great. So uh, trying to do this here. So this is how it works. You would prop yourself up, and this is what I got paid to do for like a whole um, a whole month. <laughs> It's terrible. Um, you would hold yourself up on the sides of the tank because it's five feet tall. So if you go all the way in, you're you're gonna almost drown in um in the, and so you'd hold yourself up and with your feet you would press down and you're just bare feet. You would press down the cap and it's heavy, right? It's 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 kind of bulbous on top and it's just work. It's like working through like mud or sand. And you just do that for hours on end, tank after tank after tank, because the human foot is softer and rounder on the edges, and so you're not going to break the skins as much as a metal plate would do. And it's what temperature? And yes, so the first four days that you do this, you are freezing cold because the what you're what you're up to your waist in is about or up to your mid thigh. You don't go past past seasons. What you're up to that is about the 37 degrees, and you're in the like 85 degrees so it's like you back and forth and you just do this for hours on end so it was very very hard work and so a lot of burgundy still does it this way there's very few producers in Oregon or California that do it this way but most of burgundy still does it this way because they want they're trying not to get that austerity that that makes the wines unapproachable and so really really fascinating but very, very hard work and labor intensive um, time that it takes to create Pinot Noir. And that, so if you ever wondered, why is Pinot Noir so expensive? Every other grape, I can get $15 expressions, they're delicious, but Pinot Noir, it's like anything less than $25 is just not what I'm loving. All of these reasons that we've talked about have been, um, are why that wine is, is so much more expensive. So, that's called pijage, the French term of the stirring, the pushing down of the cap um, with your body. Um, very, very, very time and labor intensive. And don't worry, it's all sanitary because this workers, we have to soak our bodies in citric acid before we jump into those tanks. So um, we burn off all of the uh, all of all of the germs before we get into the tanks. So it's all sterile, but very painful. So when when that wine is released, I can't wait to. Um, do a class on um, the 2019 vintage of uh, Patricia Green Cellars. We'll, we'll, um, and I'll tell you about every single tank I was in. <laughs> um, I probably no one, no one will go to that class. They're like, I don't want to taste foot wine, but it, it's a, it's a thing that happens all over the world. So, um, all right. So, your thoughts, your final thoughts on Pinot Noir. I'm curious, especially if most of your experience with Pinot Noir is California or Oregon styles of Pinot Noir, what you think about this style from Burgundy. And I'll leave you with uh, one final um, analogy. So while I was out in Oregon, 
as soon as you get off, you, you, you know, this is when you could still go to bars. And so I went to a wine bar and I was just like sitting there drinking gin um, because after all day of making wine, you didn't want to smell it anymore. You wanted something different. And I was just reading a book and these ladies who were from Florida. So just like start imagining, start personifying this experience. It's a five person bar. I'm by myself. There's four ladies from Florida who have been tasting wine all day. <laughs> And they're finally now they're drinking cocktails. So you can you can imagine the, the loudness and the 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 vibrant conversation that was happening. And the one lady just kept saying how much she hated Pinot Noir. <laughs> and I was like, why did you go to Oregon? That's like the one grape they produce. Everyone else produces like a million different grapes. Oregon produces 99% one grape, and that's Pinot Noir. She's like, I just like Cabernet. Pinot Noir just tastes watered down to me. And and so I started like really figuring out like what is it that people don't like about Pinot Noir and and to me if I could personify not personify bookify Pinot Noir and Cabernet into two different categories it'd be like Cabernet is like the John Grisham novel um, your classic if you if you if you spent twenty five dollars or let's say fifty dollars on a Cabernet and fifty dollars on a Pinot Noir. You're going to get a John Grisham novel. So it's going to be in your face. It's going to be bold. It's going to be kind of like all up front. There's not a whole lot of guessing games to the Cabernet. It's um, very just kind of upfront, aggressively assertive who it is. And, you, and yes, you're wondering what the final plot is, but you're not trying to guess the subtext and the slight connotation of why did he use this word instead of this word. And Pinot Noir is like reading Shakespeare. It's going to make you work for it. You're like, what the hell is he even talking about? I don't understand this. I, I get the general gist that it's about like family dynamics and they don't like each other. And, but I don't even, I don't understand the subtext. And, and, but after you work for it, those are the passages that you'll remember for years and years and years into your life. And you might not remember the John Grisham novel as much. So I think there's a time and place for everything. Um, I love Cabernet. I love California Cabernet. I love California Pinot Noir. I love Burgundy. Like very few wines that I would say I don't like at all. But Pinot Noir, especially Burgundy Pinot Noir, takes that intentionality. It takes that effort. It takes it takes the thought to read between the lines. And so if you're trying to challenge yourself to expand your palates and like this isn't your thing, just spend a little bit more time with it and then try it more regularly and get used to it. it won't seem as austere and off-putting, but I hope you really enjoyed this wine. So Brenda says we had some Patricia Green ones that was very good, but it was tight as a tick. Yeah, some of their wines are pretty, pretty aggressive. Um, and um, but it all depends on the vintage and the the clone that they use, the Pinot Noir clone. So there's multiple different clones and and um uh, it's, it's really quite interesting. So, um, Rick says this wine reminds me more of a Cote de Bone than a Cote de Nuit, more clay than limestone, a bit denser wine and definitely more like a little bit more opulent. So I would agree with you. I think they make this, this wine, the expression of this wine is meant to be a little bit, um, easier, a little bit more approachable. Um, so I would agree with you. Um, um, let's see, try a good Vermont to, to, and we'll tell you all you need to know about Burgundy. Yes. Um, yes, 100%. Um, all right. Um, well, uh, 732. Okay. I didn't finish too early because there was so much to talk about at the end, but that is it for the Pinot mutation class. Um, I figured if I called it the Pinot mutation class, I'd... <laughs> I don't know if the response would have been the same as calling the Pinot family, but I hope you enjoyed drinking all of these mutants of the Pinot um, Noir family um, in quotes. Um, let's see. Kira says, love those stories. Helps me understand why I haven't loved Pinot Noir. Need to up my price point. Unfortunately, that might be true and have more of an open mind. Um, so go in with people. Obviously, if you're if you're the only wine drinker of your friend group or family group, upping your price point for a bottle that you're not sharing with anyone is more difficult. So find a wine wine lover that wants to split a bottle and then and then or or a few people, and then you can up the price point and not have to absorb that all in one person. So 
there's wine lovers everywhere you go and uh, you just have to look around and find them for sure. So I hope to see you all next week. I know I haven't released the class schedule, but I will hopefully on Monday. And next week is going to be class on wines of Serbia and Macedonia. So two whites and two reds, very interesting, eclectic wines. Very excited about tasting those. Then the following week, we've got a Meet the Winemaker class from Lioko uh, from California. And then I can't remember what I picked up for the other two weeks, but I'm, I'm starting to plan classes all the way through April now. And so I'll release about six weeks of scheduling on Monday. So you have a upfront knowledge of what's coming around the corner. It's great to see you all, taste these amazing mutants with you all. And I hope to see you next time. Until then, drink mutants. Cheers, y'all.